Sky Hill Knight, and welcome to my channel. This is my review of Happy Death Day. I give the movie a C minus. Happy Death Day is about a young lady who finds herself being murdered by a masked killer on the evening of her birthday. But instead of staying dead, the day recycles, she wakes up in the morning, and she has to live through the day again until she either winds up being murdered and the day recycles one more time and recycles over time and recycles over time, or she finally uncovers the killer, defeats the killer, and of course, survives. Now, normally when I do a review, uh, I do a section of the good and then a section of the bad or vice versa. But in this case, I'm going to have to give some preliminary bads before I can get into the meat and potatoes of what I like and dislike about this film. So the first initial bad is, 50 Cent's In The Club, which was heavily used in the commercials and the trailers, is not in the movie. The song was used as a ringtone in the commercials, but it's not in the movie. Instead, so we get a very, very, very annoying ringtone in the movie, and it's really upsetting because that 50 Cent In The Club song was a big selling point of the film. Next bit of a complaint is that this movie is PG-13, and I didn't know that until uh, I was watching it, and I realized, hey, wait a minute, this is kind of toned down. Is this PG-13? And afterwards, I found out it was PG-13. Now, I'm the type of person who says, hey, if you want to make it PG-13, we will be fine. If you want to make an R, we will be fine. But there are some times when you really should push the envelope to its fullest, go for that R. And I think there's a missed opportunity for this movie to have been really R and go for it. Granted, it came out October the same month as Stephen King's It, so maybe they felt that having a PG-13 movie would be a little more competitive for the horror market. But still, I think it's uh, hard by not being an R-rated film. Uh, it could have been really spectacular, but unfortunately they sort of went for a bunt hit instead of swinging for the fences. The next preliminary problem is that there are a lot of things that happen in this movie for the sake of the movie. When it comes to telling stories, especially fiction, sometimes you just got to uh, go with it. Sometimes you just got to say this happened and then move on to the next thing. Uh, if you want to get to... D, E, F, uh, you got to have A, B, C, no matter how stupid or illogical or strange A, B, C would be. For instance, uh, Glinda the Good, which was kind of a jerk for not telling Dorothy how she can uh, magically get back home. Why didn't Gandalf at any time use those giant eagles to at least travel part way with the Fellowship to uh, destroy the One Ring? What if someone had actually killed Wadsworth when the lights went out? something logical or realistic were to happen in your movie, then it would totally collapse the narrative, totally uh, destroy the film. There's a lot of things that happen in this movie for the sake of there being a movie, which leads to the fourth problem. In order for a lot of stupid things to happen, Tree has to be an idiot. Now, by idiot, I don't mean the stereotypical comedic dumb blonde like uh, Chrissy Snow or Kelly Bundy. And I certainly don't mean the perceived dumb, but actually very smart, like Elle Woods or Lorelai Ambrosia. No, this young lady doesn't seem to display any type of critical thinking or intelligence that if she just sat down and thought for five minutes, just seriously sat down and thought about the situation, she could make much better decisions, figure out who the killer is, and then the movie would be over. <laughs> but of course, she has to be dumb and make dumb mistakes. Otherwise, she won't get killed. And if she doesn't get killed, the day won't recycle. If the day doesn't recycle, there won't be a movie. <laughs> Speaking of uh, recycling, no 50 Cent in the Club. Really big missed opportunity of not being R. Things have to happen for the sake of the movie to happen. And Teresa's nickname is Tree. And that's probably because she's as dumb as a stump. So one of the good things about this movie is that it's a horror comedy, and the comedy, for the most part, is pretty solid. Uh, with that PG-13 rating, they definitely went for a silly angle, and the silliness does work. Uh, there is even times when she gets killed and is shot in, at an angle to get her face, and it's like, eee! so even though she's dying, you sort of chuckle at the weird, distorted uh, face. She's also part of this sorority that's full of girls that's totally concerned about popularity and social status, 
and the leader of the sorority is such a mean girl on a cartoonist level. I wonder if she was the understudy for Pizzazz just in case Kesha were to bow out of making the Jim and the Holograms movie. So it is very funny. It's very uh, lighthearted when it needs to be. It makes use of that PG-13 rating. Another great thing that's about this movie is that uh, Tree is set up as this party girl who does a lot of drinking, probably does a couple of drugs, and has a lot of permission to assess, but she is not looked down upon for doing that. The people of her sorority, the women of sorority, they also love to party, they love to hook up with random guys, and if any negative toward Teresa happens, it's because Teresa managed to, to uh, bag a guy that someone else was going for. So the fact that she's having promiscuous sex and partying isn't seen within the uh, college community as something negative. It's only negative if she uh, succeeds better at some of the other girls who are trying to get certain guys or get certain uh, alcohol or things like that. So, while overall that's not really a positive uh, message, it's just nice to see uh, a young woman who's essentially uh, Samantha Jones in the making uh, and it's not perceived as a negative. She's a bad person. She's definitely a, you know, a terrible person as the movie begins, but she's not a bad person for having a lot of sex and drinking a lot of alcohol. So delving into the main things I didn't like about the movie, because there were several problems that I had, but uh, I mentioned how Teresa uh, doesn't display intelligence. Here's what I mean. She tries ideas once and then doesn't modify her plan until that third act. For instance, there's a point where she gets arrested uh, while trying to run away from the killer, uh, but the killer managed to catch it up, and the killer kills the officer and winds up killing her. So here's an idea. The next day, when the day recycles, why don't you just go directly to the police station and get yourself arrested or uh, in custody or something like that? You know, just go directly to the jail. Or... Here's another idea. Why don't you just run? Like, as soon as you wake up, you know, after the third or fourth time, why don't you just run? Just find a car, find a train, find a bus, you know, just keep going and going and going all day, all night. Don't stop. Or here's another idea. Why don't you just get the mask off? Like, if you get killed after the third or fourth time, why don't you just try getting the mask off? That way, you'll know who the killer is, and when the day recycles, you can confront uh, that person head on. No, she doesn't do any of that. She never just stops and thinks about handling the situation. See, it's fine that she hasn't seen movies like Groundhog Day or Edge of Tomorrow, but, you know, like, if you just sat down and thought, you'd probably figure out a better idea. So a huge problem of this movie is who the killer turns out to be. Because, again, if Teresa had just done some critical thinking, just analyze the situation, uh, she would have figured it out. I mean, granted, it's fine that she's not the world's greatest detective. It's fine that she's pretty much one viral video away from being the next celebrity that's famous for being famous. But as funny as it is to laugh at women like Jessica Simpson and Paris Hilton and God knows what happened to Anna Nicole Smith, I'm pretty sure all those women have seen movies or read books or watched plays or even seen music videos, you know, because there's so many stories and plays and books and media about people being betrayed by someone close to them. You know, everything from uh, The Last Supper to episodes of Scooby-Doo. I guess the killer based on standard procedure. And when you watch this movie, if you haven't seen it yet, you'll probably guess the killer based on standard procedure. When she finally discovers who the real killer is because there's a red herring killer, a lot of these movies have the person that say, oh, you think that's the killer. No, it's not. It's actually this person. Uh, it doesn't become the case of, oh, really? The butler did it. No kidding. It becomes, what? The butler did it? Are you kidding me? The next major problem in this movie is that Teresa is being helped by this young man uh, who clearly has a crush on her, and he gives her some advice on how to deal with the situation. That in itself is fine, but at the very end of the movie, well, almost at the extreme end of the movie, after she's finally defeated the real killer, he casually says, hey, you know, this situation kind of reminded me of that movie Groundhog Day. 
And Teresa goes, what? What are you talking about? Groundhog Day, you know, with Bill Murray. And I'm thinking, what? You know what Groundhog Day is? And just now thinking of that? I mean, they do it in the movie as a type of, um, you know, wink, wink, ha, 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 hey, you mentioned Groundhog Day. But by mentioning Groundhog Day, it totally breaks the narrative. You know how, despite there being decades worth of zombie-themed media, there will still be new stories or properties in which the characters have no idea what a zombie is, never seen a zombie, doesn't even have the word zombie in their vocabulary? You do that so that your characters are legitimately scared. The more they know about the situation or creatures you're dealing with, the less scared or tension there will be. Ignorance is necessary. That's why Teresa is so fundamentally stupid, because if she knew how to deal with the situation, again, there'd be no movie. She figured her way out. So by having the boyfriend not mention Groundhog Day until the very end of the movie, it doesn't make sense, because if someone mentions Time Loop and you've seen Groundhog Day, the gold standard of time loop movies, you're going to talk about that initially. You're not going to remember that at the very end of the film. Imagine if you had a character saying, oh, I, I, I've seen these spirits, you know, like this first spirit, he showed me my childhood and my past and all these things I did when I was young. And then I saw another spirit, he was showing me stuff that was happening right about now, or like days or, or you know, it's really close. I think there's going to be one more spirit coming. I, I don't know what to do. I don't understand this. A character mentions spirits and seeing the past and the present, but at the very end of the movie, the uh, helper character finally goes, oh yeah, that kind of like uh, a Christmas cow. That was just ridiculous. It, it's fine that Teresa doesn't know about time loop movies, but if her big helping friend is not, it knows about time loop movies and it doesn't mention the gold standard of time loop movies, Again, it becomes more of that stupidness for the sake of stupidness. It becomes more of that he can't mention it or else there won't be a movie. And just breaks the narrative and really, really, really frustrated me. But the big nail in the coffin for me is that Teresa managed to get away with murder twice. Twice. See, in the movie, there is a red herring killer. And then, of course, the real killer. First, she kills the red herring killer but still winds up dying that evening in the day recycles. So that's how she finds out that the person she thought was a killer isn't the real killer, which leads to her finding out who the real killer was, uh, which in itself is fine. But the problem is when she kills the red herring killer and when she kills the real killer, there are no witnesses. And from all of his purposes, it looks like a straight up homicide. Now I live in Florida and recently learned about things called stand your ground laws. Stand your ground laws basically boil down to if two people get into a physical confrontation and someone gets killed and the person that survives claims self-defense and there were no witnesses, then the police will have to take the survivor's word for it that it was self-defense and let that person go which is fine if you're being mugged or falling to some type of uh, barroom brawl or something like that. But in both of these situations, there's no way she would at least spend several hours or the night in jail. See, when she kills the real killer, the person that dies is probably such an upstanding citizen that she doesn't even have so much as a traffic ticket to her name. Whereas the person that survived, Tree, uh, she's probably so hungover that she fail a breathalyzer test before her lips ever even touched the nozzle. So it was just weird that she would just get away with it and, you know, not at least be arrested and detained for several hours. But more importantly, when she kills the red herring killer, the red herring killer is a serial killer suspect in custody in a hospital. And Tree winds up killing her by taking a knife, holding the guard by knife point, taking the guard's gun, holding now the gun and knife at that guard, tells the guard, go get help. And while the guard is away, there's a physical confrontation, and she winds up killing the serial killer suspect with the gun. Now, I don't care what the stand your ground laws say. There's no way you can threaten a cop with knife and his own gun, kill a suspect with that gun, and not spend the night 
in jail. That's just totally unrealistic. But again, if she spent the night in jail, she wouldn't die. If she didn't die, the day doesn't recycle. The day doesn't recycle. She didn't find out with a killer. And of course, there'd be no climax in, in the movie. I mean, I could slightly swallow the murder of the real killer, but not that red hair killing. No way. You can't just take a guy, a cop's gun, kill someone with that gun, and not spend the night in jail. Even if you made a bargain the next morning, you're going to spend the night in jail. I could go on and on about how disappointed I was about this movie. I mean, look at this. This is six pages worth of notes that I did for this movie. More than any film I reviewed, good and bad. And you may be wondering, why am I so worked up about a film that's probably going to be forgotten by this time next year unless they make a sequel? Which they probably will make a sequel because it was financially uh, successful for the film company. It's because this movie was the one movie out of the whole year that I was excited about based on the premise and the trailer. This was a movie that wasn't a sequel. It wasn't a remake slash reboot. It didn't have a big name star. It wasn't some attempt at a giant expanded universe. And it didn't feature a superhero of some kind or other. This is a movie that I knew absolutely nothing about. And yet, just by stumbling upon the trailer, watching the trailer, I went from, eh, what's this Happy Death Day to, oh my goodness, I got to see Happy Death Day. When is it coming out? I got to go and see it. I mean, sure, there were movies that I said, okay, that looks cool. That looks interesting. That, that looks uh, fun. But no, this was the movie that said, wow, I got to check that out. This is the same studio who earlier in the year gave us movie uh, Get Out. And Get Out was phenomenal. And both Get Out and Happy Death Day are essentially uh, the plot of a Twilight Zone episode made into a feature-length movie. And whereas Get Out is a masterpiece, this movie is just okay. And then when you look back at some of the other uh, movies that this uh, Blumhouse has put out, they should be going for more than just okay at this point. So yeah, I probably hyped myself up for more than what this movie was willing to offer or going to offer. But even as I adjusted my expectations, the way the movie ends, the way that there are so many stupidness for the sake of the film, but the way that the killer is revealed to be someone that anyone with half a brain would probably put her on the list of suspects, it's just something that really could have been special, really could have stood out. This could have been really, really excellent. And at the very least, give us what you advertise. Okay, I'm not really a fan of Phineas and in, in the Club, but it was a cool part of the trailers, a cool part of the commercial. It would have really fit into the narrative of this movie. Don't advertise things you're not going to put in. If you have the license to put it in the trailers, you probably have the license to put it in the movie. And if you're not going to put it in the movie, at least put in something as cool as that song. Don't put in something that's really, really annoying. Okay, just give us what you advertise, please. All right, please. This movie gets a C-. minus. Okay, thank you very much for watching. I greatly appreciate it. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe this video. And of course, if you did not like the video, go ahead and click the dislike button too. I'm not afraid of dislike button. I just enjoy feedback from all sides. Okay, thank you very much for watching. And remember, find inspiration everywhere.